morning, everyone. Good morning. So good to see you all today. Hope you've had a good weekend. Yeah. Good worship service so far. Thank yeah. you to our worship team up yeah. there. Thank and you know, I really look, yeah, they do a great job. And I really look forward to next week seeing uh, our young Amen. worship team. All right. Yeah. Not the B team, okay? Just the young, fiery team. Okay, looking forward to that. Raising up new talent. All right, so today we're concluding our series on greater vision. That's what we've been talking about. This is the fifth part and the concluding part of the series. So we've been talking about it for quite a while so far. And I hope it's been helping you yes. to gain a greater vision, as the name suggests. There's no question about it. God wants us to be visionaries. He's an incredible visionary, and he calls us as his people to be visionaries. Yeah. And so we've been talking about that, studying about that, and we've gone through, and I'll just review here briefly. If you've missed any of these, please go to our website, go to our YouTube channel, and you can catch up by watching those sermons. But the first one was on a vision of God. And that was just like a biblical survey of different people who've seen the Lord. And then some practicals about how we can regain, or maybe for the first time, have a clear vision of God. Then the next one was on vision of the past. And we talked about how important it is to see God in your past and to see God in our collective past. Because it really gives us faith and confidence to face the future if we can look and see how and why he's led us to the point that he has. Mm -hmm. And then the third one was on vision of the present. I like that. Again, before you can ever look to the future, you want to really have a clear vision of the present so you don't get skewed in your vision for the future. And we talked about having a humble vision of ourselves, mm -hmm. a graceful vision of others, and a hopeful vision of suffering in the present. And then after all that, with that foundation, we were able to start talking about vision for the future last week. And so we talked about the first dimension of that, and the most important, eternal vision. Nice. That we are eternal people. The Bible says that God has set eternity in the hearts of men. And the fact is, we're either going to spend that eternity in heaven or spend that eternity in hell. Don't know exactly what either of those will be like, but I know where I want to be, okay? I know where I hope you want to be and where I want to help as many other people as possible be. And so we talked about having a vision of being in heaven and making that more real. You know, Paul said, encourage each other with these words. When he talked about Jesus coming back and we're going to be caught up with him in the air and all that's going on, he's like, encourage each other with these words. It's kind of become not... I don't know, not respectable, not not normal to talk about heaven. Mm. Like, it just kind of feels weird to talk about heaven. Like, like it's a cop-out on life in the present. It's the antithesis of responsibility and taking ownership for your life if you're too focused on heaven. Nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah. It's that eternal vision that gives greater life and brings everything yeah. into more vivid clarity for the rest of our lives Amen. in this vision right. on earth. So Amen. we talked about eternal vision, and then today we're gonna to conclude on continuing to talk about vision for the future, but practical vision. Right. Practical vision. Now, when I say practical vision, it doesn't mean that all the other lessons weren't practical at all, okay? <laughs> they weren't really practical, okay? They're super practical. We applied them all to our lives. It's really important to understand, but they're, they're more foundational in nature than they are, you know, just super practical in your day-to-day -day lives, by and large. Mm -hmm. So in addition to all the things we've already talked about that were parts of a practical vision mm -hmm. here on Earth, we're going to focus today on four parts. Okay, four parts of having a practical vision and how to be a true visionary in and of this world. The first is spiritual vision. Now, all of these are going to come and they're going to focus on Jesus because Jesus was the ultimate visionary. And one of the reasons he came to earth is to show us how to live, to show us what our goal should be. Let me be a model to you guys. Let me be a vision 
for you so you can follow in my steps and see how to live in this world. So we're going to look to the example of Jesus and how he was the vision of these things and how he truly pursued vision in each of these areas as well. So the first is spiritual vision. In each of these, I'm asking a question. Okay, It's kind of a tagline question that goes along with it. Spiritual vision. How much can you love God? Come on. Good question. That is a really good question for your lives. Like, is there anything more important than that? Right. As the Bible right. says, we read here in Mark 12, verse 28, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Mm. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart mm. and with all your soul mm. and with all your mind and with all your strength. If that's the most important commandment, in all of God's word that is like the, the direction, the GPS of how to live our lives, mm -hmm. then how could we have a vision for the future without having a vision of really loving God? Yeah. So it's so important because this command is so important in the eyes of God. So vision here, spiritual vision, it means, it means dreaming, planning, mm -hmm. pursuing, envisioning yourself Loving God more in the future than you do now. I mean, that's really what it is. It's like, how can I love him more? I, I remember as a young minister in San Francisco, and for whatever reason, I was preparing this sermon, this just popped into my head. I remember we had this with the other like interns, like the young campus ministers. We had this late night prayer night. We called it an all night, but I think we kind of ended it about 4 a.m. Okay, okay, that's all right. So it was a late night. But we went to uh, Twin Peaks. And does anybody know the Bay Area? Anybody know Twin Peaks? So Twin Peaks is just this cool area over on the San Francisco side. And it's like these light towers. And you can go up there on these hills and overlook the whole Bay Area. It's just an incredible place. And so we went up there and just were spending this time in prayer. Was really, we got, we got like kind of delirious. You know, sometimes you do, okay, those late night prayer nights. I remember this one guy, Todd, was talking. And he's like, we were saying, okay, what do you want us to pray for for you? And he's like, you know, John, could you just pray that, that I really, you know, devote myself to God and I give myself to him. And, and Father God, I just pray that I, wait, 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 you know, I just give a prayer. I am not your father. <laughs> like he just kind of, he kind of lost it. He's like falling asleep. He thought he was praying to me or whatever. I'm like, okay, it's time to go home. But I remember during that time, just going off and we had this alone time. And I remember thinking, I was reading the Psalms and I thought, wow, Dave loved God so much. Mm -hmm. Then I thought, has the person who's loved God more than anyone else ever did already lived? Mm -hmm. Come on. Why can't I be that guy? Yeah, yeah. Not in a competitive way. I want to be number one, okay? I'm talking about DK kind of a way. Okay, <laughs> but, 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 just, but, but, but really, yeah. like, yeah. do I think that, or why can't I? Yes. Love God more than anyone has ever loved God. And it really just was moving my heart. Well, when you look to Jesus' example, you see how much he loved the Father in some really practical ways. You see that he loved him enough to get baptized. And these are appeals to us practically as well. How can we love God more? Love him enough to get baptized. Luke uh, 3.21, you can look it up later. It says when all the people were being baptized... Jesus was baptized too. He's like in line. Okay, lining up. All right, time for me to get baptized. When he was, everyone's getting baptized, he got baptized. Love God enough to start your journey. Okay. Like to commit your life to him. That's like your, your wedding. Love him enough to, to put a ring on it, right? I mean, love him enough to say, I'm committed for life. That's what baptism is all about. Awesome. I love seeing people studying the Bible. I love seeing people thinking about becoming a Christian. If you're one of those people, love God enough to get baptized and become a Christian. Then we see it with Jesus in another appeal practically. Love him enough to spend quality time with him. Yeah. Luke 5, 16, it says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places where he prayed. You know, I love that because Jesus was here for the people. And he was always immersing himself in people and giving and giving. The crowds are pressing against him till late at night he's healing their disease and sickness. So you think of him as always with the people, but that wasn't the case. Because he often withdrew yep. to lonely places sure. where he prayed. There were times the disciples go, where is he? Yeah. And 
There he is, walking on water out in the middle of the lake. Where is he? Oh, man, he got up before everybody else just so he could go be all alone so he could pray. He pursued God. It's interesting. You go, even Jesus prayed, which is kind of a mind bender because we pray through Jesus. And you go, wait, you are God in the flesh. Are you praying to yourself? You're like, how's that work? But he had all the limitations of man as well. And so he knew how crucial prayer was. Even though he had this open line with the Father, they're one and the same. He still loved the Father enough to want to spend quality time awesome. with him. Wow. What marriage that's successful doesn't understand that? Right. Yeah. How much more if we love God will mm -hmm. we want to spend time with him? Another practical, love him enough to please him with your actions. John 8, 29. The one who sent me is with me, for I always do what pleases him. Ooh. A lot of those words we could say. I bet every one of us could stand up and say, the one who sent me is with me, for I do what pleases him. But that one word always wow. mm. is yeah. what sets Jesus yeah. apart. Can any of us say that? No. Always. Always for the last minute. <laughs> I mean, that's about, maybe that's my record. I don't know. Maybe I just got vain and I indeed ended that record. I don't know. But, but, but no, I mean that always. You go, wow. He loved God enough to always do what pleased him. He's tempted to, to, to maybe commit a sin. He's tempted to omit something God wants him to do. He's tempted to cut back. He's tempted to compromise. But he's like, I will always do what pleases him. And so I think about that. I go, I want to love God enough. I want to, I envision the future where I love him enough to, to I've already become a Christian or I remain a Christian. I want to love him enough to where I want to spend quality time with him. I want to love him enough to where I, I always do what pleases him. That is my goal. That's what, that's what spiritual vision is all about. So what's your very spiritual vision? How much? Can you love God? What are you doing now that if you were to take your love for God to the next level yes. would change? Mm -hmm. What's that thing? What's mm -hmm. that sin to give up? What's that prayer to start happening? What's that lonely place you should start going to often? What's that commitment you should start following through with it? What is it for you? But that's where a vision should always be. How much can I, can you love God? Yes. The next part of this practical vision, relational vision. How much can you love others? Again, we looked at Jesus. That same passage in Mark 12. The second, second greatest command is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus, again, was the perfect example of this. Like, you look at how he loved. All the physical mental limitations that we have, right? I mean, he was hungry, he was tired, he was thirsty. I mean, he hurt, you know, it wasn't like that cross didn't hurt, wasn't like, I mean, he had all those limitations. And yet he just kept loving and loving and loving. And, and probably unlike us, there were very few that really loved him back. And, and for those who didn't love him back, there were many that didn't just walk the other way and go, hmm, I'm not going to love him. Right. But who actually hated him and pursued him mm. and picked on him and, and persecuted him and eventually killed him. And yet he just kept loving. Look at some examples of this. In, in Matthew 5, verse 44, on, he tells his disciples, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He's not even commanding them to love their family, stuff like that. There's other verses. But he's like, let's talk about who you're not loving. Let's talk about the people that are the hardest to love. My expectation is you will love those people. Wow. Whoever is your enemy, you go, I, I don't have an enemy. Well, there's somebody that you're tempted not to love. Maybe they're in this room. Maybe they're not. Maybe there's somebody else. Maybe someone from your past. Mm -hmm. But that's the relational vision. How much can I love? Who am I not loving that I can start loving? John 13, verse 1. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Yeah. And who remembers what he went on to do right after that? Wash the disciples' feet. So here, you know, the first 12 chapters of John, 
Man, he's doing a lot of things to serve and love all these people. But he's just sitting there going, okay, you know what? Now I want to show him even more love. How can I love him even more? I mean, he came down to die for them. He lived a sinless life for them. He chose these people. He's poured himself into them. But he's going, and he goes, I just want to show him more love. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to wash their feet. I'm going to get in there in the nooks and crannies of their dirty, stinky, sandaled feet in this Middle Eastern madness of dust. You know, and he just goes, I'm just going to get in there and humbly love them selflessly like that. Why did he do that? He just wanted to keep pressing his love, pressing the envelope. Not to love like he already had, but to love even more. So he pressed it. John 13, verse 34, he goes on, A new command I give you, love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know you're my disciples if you love one another. We looked earlier, the second greatest command, love others as yourself, love your neighbor as yourself. He's like, man, i got a whole new expectation for you. Now in these first 13 chapters, now including the washing of feet, all the ways I've loved you, loved you that's how you are to love one another. And the world is going to see that love. It's going to be so strikingly different from everything else that they're going to go, that could only be Jesus. Yeah. That was his vision. He's just pressing that love. Not just content with him pressing his own love, but calling others and pressing them to yeah. love just like him. In John 15, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Mm. He goes on to say, you are my friend. And I bet they never forgot that, right? To hear from Jesus, you are my friends. You know, Peter had heard not too long before that, you know, you are a stumbling block to me. I mean, Peter had heard a lot of different things, you know, but to hear, you are my friend, that's pretty cool. And then greater love is knowing this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And what did Jesus go on to do? Lay down his life, not only for his friends, but for his enemies as well. So relational vision is, is imitating Jesus and pushing your love to the next level. Loving more this year than you did last year. Come on. Ever increasing love. Remember we had that theme one year we focused on, on that passage in 1 Thessalonians which says, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. God is always wanting our love to increase. And that's the relational vision. How much more can I love? Now, we got to be really careful here to not fall into the trap with relational vision that says, man, I have a vision of having great friendships. I have a vision of, of, of having great marriage. I have a vision of having, you know, being really close to a lot of people. That's good. As long as that vision doesn't include how they should be loving you. And that's what I've seen happen a lot of times when we talk about a relational vision. We start thinking about if they would love me more, mm. we'd be doing awesome. Yeah. If they would reach out to me more, if they would talk to me more, if they would do this for me, if they would believe in me, oh if they would just return my calls, if they would. And we think about other people and we think that we're a victim. When we talk about our relationships and we're more focused on what others didn't do or aren't doing for us. Our vision is in the wrong place, and it's a hopeless place to be because you can't control other people. And that was never the kind of relational vision that Jesus had. Yeah. Jesus' vision was, I'm going to pour my life in. I'm going to wash their feet. It's not like, now wash my feet. You know, when are you going to wash mine? Like, that's not the way he did it. He's just thinking, how much more can I give? And so the people who have the best relationships are the ones that don't have the relational vision for how others should be loving them more. But rather, they're focused on the relational vision of how can I love that brother more? How can I love that sister more? How can I love that person more? You with me there? Yeah. That's the challenge. Awesome, to man. expect nothing. Appreciate everything. And call yourself to give everything and give more. So thinking of it that way, what's your relational vision for saying, your marriage. You know, marriages get to points where you kind of reach this tenure and it can kind of flatline. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you know, we got the groove. <laughs> you know, we're going through the groove and it's not bad. It's, you know, it's, it's okay, but it's just flatlining. Mm. That's fine for times. We all have times like that. 
But when that's the definition of your marriage, that starts to feel old and stale. Yeah. And that's when things start to do. That's when people start looking elsewhere to get those needs met. What's the next level for your marriage? I was talking to a brother just this week, and he was, he was bringing this up. And he goes, you know, what I want to do with my wife, I, I want to get a book and, and it, where we're each reading it, and we're reading it through it together just to deepen our marriage. Because I just this year, I want our marriage to get deeper. And he's got a great marriage. I would look at him and go, man, he could teach classes on marriage. But he's just thinking, what's the next level? See, that's the relational vision that we're talking about. Same with parenting. As you're thinking about your kids are older than they were. They're in different situations than they were. Your vision of what you, who you were as a parent in yesteryear yeah, right. is not, it better change yeah. in how you're going to be a vision, what your vision is for your parent in this time. And as kids age, man, our parenting has to change yeah. with that. We got to keep up with the times and we got to make that transition look up just like Jesus that no longer call your servants, I call you friends. Like there has to be this maturity and growth. But but what are those stages? What's the next level for you? I don't know. But that's where you want to learn yeah. and grow and think, what's my relational vision for my parenting Good. or for your friendships? Deepening the ones you have. What can you do to deepen them? Starting new ones. What new ones can you forge? I was talking to another brother recently, and he was just talking about how lonely he is. Mm -hmm. It's hard. A, a lot of the brothers he was close to moved away a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And he's just been kind of hanging there for a few years. And he's a great brother. But, you know, that's where you've got to get a relational vision of going, yeah. okay, i got to build new ones. Yep, yep. It's not just going to come to you. The vision isn't, when is someone going to love me? That likely won't happen. But the vision has to be, how can I love more? That's good. What's the next level in your friendships? Or boyfriend, girlfriend, future marriage. What's go. next level for you? Next what level. can you do to pursue that vision? We all need relational visions. You know, I was really inspired several weeks ago. When Jen Dunn shared in a welcome, and she shared it a few different times in a few different ways, she may have a, a, a relational vision for having a boyfriend one day. I'm not really sure about that. But I know as a single woman, she has a vision for right now of how she can serve and love and be like an auntie yeah. to all the young yeah. ladies in the church. And she's like, I am going to love them like they're my own. I'm going to have weekend sleepovers. I'm going to take them here and take them there. And I just look and I go, that is so amazing. Yeah. Not having a vision for something she don't have, she doesn't have or can't control. But going, I'm going to have a vision for what I can control yes. and what I can give. And it's not Jen, just an incredible yeah. example. Yeah. I love that. That's how we all need to envision in our have vision in our relationships, vision for how you can love more. And those visions have a lot better chance of becoming a reality. So relational vision, spiritual vision, how much can you love God? Relational vision, how much can you love others? And third, individual vision. How can you be most useful to God? How can you be most useful to God? Again, Jesus was a master of this. I mean, no single life, well, has any just individual life ever been more useful to God than Jesus? Put it that way. I mean, I can't even imagine one. You know, maybe second is Paul. I, I don't know. But you go, that one life, gosh, I mean, he used every talent, every waking hour, every resource, every bit of energy just to glorify God, to be useful for God. And he wrote about it quite a bit in, uh, in Matthew chapter 25. Let's go ahead and read this together. It's too big to put the whole slide up here. But in Matthew 25, beginning in verse 14, speaking of the kingdom of God, it says again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. 
After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who'd received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you had trusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man who'd received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew you're a hard man. Harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I've not sown and gather where I've not scattered grain. Well, then you should have put my money on, on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him. And give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, wow. Yikes. That story turned from good to bad you know, really quickly there. But here in this, in this story, you know the story. It uses the word talent because that was a sum of money. And sometimes we get confused, though there is an application to our own talents. But the point is the master gave a certain bit of resources to each person. Some used those resources for the master's purposes and for his glory. And one didn't. He's like, nah, I'm going to do something else with it. I want to kind of do my own thing. And he neglected it. And the response from the master was really extreme. He goes, man, that guy, he's lazy, wicked, and worthless. Throw him out into darkness where there's whatever weeping and gnashing. Like that. I go, I don't, I don't want to know it. That's kind of like where the worm does not die. Okay, like, like we looked at last week. That's just kind of a vision of a bad place that I don't want to be. But I really believe not only was Jesus teaching this to others, this was the way he lived his life. He'd been given a certain yeah. bunch of resources. Life itself, his gifts, his energies, his knowledge, his insights, his miraculous abilities. And he used every bit of them for the Father's glory. Yeah. Yeah. See, we've each been entrusted with unique gifts. Yeah. It doesn't matter who you are. And, and there's the, the comparison, there's no point even comparing. Yeah. You know, right. one had five, one had two, one had one. It, it, there's not a comparison. We've each been given yeah. unique gifts. Yeah. I, I like to define gifts as abilities, passions, or experiences, or opportunities that God gives us in hopes that we'll use them for his glory. He gives them to everybody. Well, you know, a baby's born. Bam! You know, they've got certain innate abilities already. There's the nature. Then there's the nurture. And as they grow up, they learn this from their family, this from school, this from their life experiences. They develop more talents, more abilities. They, they have opportunities through their jobs or relationships. And, and he looks after he's given all that and he hopes that first the people are going to become Christians. But then when they become a Christian, he goes, wow, now they're a Christian, that's awesome. But now I have a hope that they'll use those gifts that I gave them for my glory. Mm -hmm. And imagine how he feels when it's like, nope, they're using that for their job. Nope, they're just using that for their own well-being, their own money, their own hobby. They're using them for all these other things. But, but for me... They're burying those talents. Matter of fact, I can see the, the dirt in their fingernails mm. as they buried their, their resources, their gifts. They're not using them mm. to advance my cause. I can't help but fe hear, feel his, his sadness yeah. that people are not using the gifts he gave mm. for his glory. Romans talks about this. Romans 12. Paul talks about it in verse 4. For just as each of us has one body, <clears throat> excuse me, with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, 
and prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. God gives gifts. He's given us all very different gifts. So the question is, are you using those gifts that he's given you for his glory? Are you using them for his cause? Think about your work or your school. It's right to excel and be our best in our work and school. It's not wrong to use those God-given talents to be the best worker, the best employee, the best student we can possibly be. Rightly so. But are you doing all that so that God can be glorified in some way? Is it so that you can make more money so you can be more generous? Is it so that you can reach new circles of influence and help more people know God? Is it so that he can be really pleased by seeing that a Christian can be this successful? What is it? Is it or is it just, no, I'm doing it for me because I love it. Well, are you doing it for you or are you doing it for God? We need to be doing these things for God. What's your vision for serving within the church? What is your vision for using your gifts for serving within the church? I want to ask you five questions to consider. As you seek to find your niche by, by faith, look at end of vision. What's my niche in the church? How can I be useful to God within his body? Here's some questions. First, what are your abilities? You've got some. But what are they? What are you good at? Like, you know, I know we can, you know, be falsely humble, but, but what's something you're good at? And you go, I have this strength, I have this strength. List those things out. What are your abilities? Another question. What are your passions? Sometimes we may not have abilities, but we really love something. You're like, man, you know, okay, I'm terrible at this, but I love this. Okay, I really love it. Like, what's your passion? Because passion, if you're passionate about something, man, that, you're going to be a lot more effective in it, right? Even if you lack some ability, passion makes up for a lot of things. Yeah. What are your passions? Okay, not talking about sinful passions. What are your, your godly passions or just life passions? What are your passions? Another question, what are your experiences? Your life experiences, what's unique to you? The way you were raised, the places you've lived, the perspective you have, the, the health challenges you've endured, the health challenges you're facing, the, the, whatever. Like we yeah. all have experiences. What are yours? Then what are your opportunities at your age, at your stage of life, in your community, in your job, in your field? What are your opportunities? And then with all those in mind, how can you help others? Like, what are ways you can make a difference in other people's lives and just helping other people? Ask yourself those questions and pray about them. Talk to your closest relationships. Hey, what do you think about these areas? Hey, honey, what would you say about these areas? What are my abilities? What are my passions? What are my experiences? What are my opportunities? How can I help people? And what a great discussion for your house churches. Yeah. Just to go around and share. Because sometimes we're blind to what our abilities are or what our experiences are. We forget. These are good questions to talk with one another and pray about them. I am so grateful that for a church as small as our church yeah. is, we have so many gifts that God has just like thrown out yeah. into the group, all right? I mean, there's things, you know, in a, that a bigger church may have more, but we got a lot even for our little church, right? Amen. And I'm so grateful that there's so many gifted people. Every one of you is gifted in some way like we're talking about here. So the question is, are you using those personal gifts to advance God's cause? To bring him glory and to strengthen his church. So let me just ask you, if you're serving in one of these areas, I know I'm putting you on the spot. I'm not doing it to embarrass you or anybody. I just want, I want you to really think about this actively and not just passively. Okay. If you're serving in the AV ministry in any way, shape, or form, stand up. 
Go ahead and do that. If you're serving in ushering, stand up as well. If you're ushering and helping in any way in that regard, song leading, worship, the music ministry, stand up. Kids kingdom, teacher, helper. I don't mean like this moment, but you, you, you regularly do that. If you're a house church leader or assistant house church leader, stand up. If you're in the social media ministry, stand up. If you're on the diversity team, stand up. If you serve with Hope Worldwide and the Hope team, stand up. If you're part of the men's integrity ministry, stand up. If you give financially to help advance the church, stand up. If you're giving special benevolence to someone, stand up. If you reach out and share your faith to try to bring people to Jesus, stand up. See, there's so many people that are so involved. I applaud you all. Let's go. Yeah. We have a very serving church. Go ahead and sit back down. I appreciate that. But here's the thing. We need more people in this church wearing more hats. Yeah, we do. Everyone can wear one and should be wearing at least one. If not, put your hat on. <laughs> and, but don't just put your hat on. Like, you want to have that hat? Okay, I have this hat that I've worn so much. Barry said, time for that hat to be retired. <laughs> and I'm like, I love the sweat stains yeah. on that hat. It just that says, out. like, that's his hat. You know, there's just something about it. But I'm like, I broke down and to buy a new hat. But I still use that for running or something because that's my, like, tough guy hat. But, but that's how, like, well, let me ask you this. Like, what kind of hat do you have? In your area of service. Come on. Is it like a brand new? You haven't even taken the sticker off yet. You know those people that still keep the sticker on? Like that's a fad or something yeah, like that. Thing, Some of you, maybe yeah. maybe you go, yeah, I'm in this ministry. But your, your hat hasn't any sweat on it. It's got the sticker. It's got the price tag on it. You can still take it back and trade it in. That doesn't count. You want a well-worn hat because you're so passionate about your area of service. You yes. go, man, this hat is worn. But then one hat isn't enough. We have too much to do and yeah. too few people for yeah. everyone just to wear one hat. Yeah. And imagine if everyone just wore one hat. Yeah. We, we, just like, we wouldn't be able to have a Sunday service. <laughs> so many people wear multiple hats, but we need more people yeah. wearing those multiple hats. Right? We need more. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Right now, in the body, let me just tell you practically. Help us out. Some of the greatest needs... We have, and I, I put these out there for you to consider, is God calling you to, to have a vision of, of helping people, of being useful to God in this way. We need more worship singers, especially men. We need more people to help with AV. I appreciate Hunter. Hunter shows up early every week. He's, he's what? Is, is he 10 right now? 11? How old is he? 11 and a half. In 11 and a half. Okay. On, he's 11 and a half. Man, he's growing up. He just sets up all the AV stuff. Like, I, mean, I so appreciate that. We need more hunters. We do need more hunters, too. I'd love to have a hunting <laughs> district. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need more hunters like that. Okay. AV, ushering. Man, we get here, me and Kim. I mean, we're just, and, 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 eight, and, uh, and Adrian, and there's some others. Like, there's Kim, you know, setting up all the chairs, moving all the chairs around every week. We need more people helping like that yeah. in, in ushering. Website. We need more people in our website ministry. Some of you have gifts and talents. We need those. Social media. Come on, young people. Man, I'm like an old guy trying to do social media. I don't even know what it is sometimes. Like, I got to learn. And like, what is this? What does that mean? And I try my best, but we need more minds, young minds on that kids' kingdom. There's times we have to cancel it because we don't have enough people to teach in it. Oh, mercy. Literally. That happens like that's in the present. In hope, Phil is some incredible visions of how we can serve the poor and needy in this community. But oftentimes, when he asks for volunteers to show up, it can be like pulling teeth. We need more volunteers. Family group leaders. Gosh, I'd love to be able to start a few family groups. We have, we have some really large family groups, but we need more leaders that can step up. Devotion to your family groups. We have family groups, but when half the people don't show up regularly, it makes that family group, everybody suffers. Yep. That's a great hat you can put on and wear out. Just go into the family groups. Financial giving, meeting various needs. 
helping people move, home repairs, encouragement, benevolence. There's so many things, but here's the thing. We need you. We got like 500 hats. I'm ready to just give out the hats. Give the hat but you gotta out. wear the hat. You gotta make it sweaty. Yeah. You gotta pour your, your passion yeah. into any hat that the Lord gives you because we want to be the most useful to God we can possibly be. Amen. The fourth and final part, congregational vision. Okay. What can we accomplish together? Okay, I think about Lowe's. Let's build something together right there. Okay, yeah. that to put that away. Okay. But like, what can we accomplish together? Acts 2, verse 42. This is the description of the very first church. Yeah. The very first one. In its incipient stage. Like, like Bryce and Melissa's kids that just popped out one day. They're like this new life. The church just popped out. And here's this beautiful church. Verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And to the fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone as he had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That to me is like the most beautiful mm. picture, image, vision in the past of what the church was in its pristine form, the closest to Jesus' teaching that it could ever be. Yes. The very first congregation, so beautiful. Look at each of these lines. They devoted themselves. You know that word devoted? Mm. It's not like... Yeah, they kind of they kind of did some stuff. Mm -hmm. Sweaty hats. That's what they had. They devoted themselves, and then I like devoted themselves. It wasn't like people said, "Bro, you need to be more devoted." I bet that took place at times. But the disciples just go, "Here I am. I'm going to devote myself. Wow. I'm going all in. Yeah. I'm devoted." Come that was on. the very first thing that described the early church. Yes, they devoted themselves. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Then it says everyone was filled with awe. Ah, oh, this respectful, reverent fear of God. And they were filled with it. It wasn't like, yeah, they had some focus on God every now and then. No, they're filled with it. And it says everyone. Mm. All of those disciples were filled with awe. And it says many wonders and miraculous signs were, were happening in the present. Well, it wasn't like, wow, I pray that it'd be 13 degrees and it was 13 degrees, you know, woo, God, you know, the weather could have told you that. But I mean, they're talking real miracles. Like, I mean, real miracles. And it was just happening left and right. They had faith. All the believers were together. Amen. They were together. Though, though they're very diverse. They're diverse in age and gender, in religious background, in socioeconomic background, in geography. Yes. But they were all together. All the believers were one like that. And then it says they gave to anyone. As they had need, contribution, benevolence, serving, helping the poor. They continued to meet together. It wasn't just something they did for like that first week. They continued. Mm. Like they just continued meeting together. They didn't stop meeting together. Mm -hmm. They had glad hearts, sincere hearts. Mm. They just love God and they're happy in their Christianity. Joyful devotion. It says they were praising God. They're focused on God. They enjoyed the favor of the people. People liked them because of what they were doing. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They, somebody's getting baptized every day. You just see that church growing every day because God was adding to their number. And then that church in Jerusalem, what's cool to read about in the rest of the, of the book of Acts is it just keeps getting replicated was replicated in, in Antioch, replicated in Corinth, replicated in, in, in Ephesus, in uh, throughout Galatian region, in Colossae. Like all the letters you see in the seven churches in Revelation, those are the churches that they go, it wasn't just that one, but they go, let's start a new church. And then it was replicated and those churches had the exact same blueprint. When I close my eyes 2,000 years later and I envision what every family group, every house church in our church should be, and what this congregation should be. I close my eyes, I go, what's my vision for the Des Moines church? 
It's that. Yeah. It really is. It's Acts chapter 2. Each of those lines we just went through, that's what I envision. Awesome. That's what I pursue. That's my dream. That's what I really want to see happen. And then not only here in this church, but then to see that replicated and aims for them to have their yeah. own church on, in Cedar Rapids and Iowa City in yeah. Sioux City, just to be able to start churches where yeah. they're seen. Acts 2, 42 through 47, in the exact same way. And you're just going, wow, not only are there baptisms regularly, but there's replication of churches regularly. And then one day, God willing in Iowa, to see the Lord add to their number daily. Come on, Those who are being saved. Amen. Wow. We had one day where three people was baptized. That was awesome. That was a good day. That was a good day. That made us daily for three days. But, but, but you know, daily throughout the whole year. Man, how inspiring would that be? If you're visiting, well, I really want to appeal to you. Be a part of our vision. Be a part of God's vision for the church. It's special. God is doing some amazing things here. We're on the move. We're breaking out of the COVID lull and, yeah. and moving on towards even greater things. And if you are visiting here today, we, we have these little booklets and, and Phil shared a little bit about it. I just want to make this really clear. These are for the guests who come. Now, if a member wants one of these and wants to give them to their friends, you can order them on Amazon. They, they, they don't make any profit. Uh, the brother that did this, $3.99, order on Amazon, you can give them to your friends. But the ones we have in the back, that's for any of our guests who come today. If you're interested in finding out more of what it, what it means to be a member of our church, this little booklet will guide you through some Bible studies along those lines. It's a great tool. But with all these visions, and whatever else you envision, your life here on earth being, maybe you have a personal vision, personal passion we haven't talked about today. I would encourage you to remember the words Jesus gives that, that provide the energy, that provide the boost to not just pursuing a fantasy. The Bible says all hard work brings a profit. He who chases fantasies lacks judgment. There's a difference between vision and fantasy. Vision is what happens. You ever hear that quote from, from Sir Lawrence from Labia, of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence? He says, all men dream, but not equally. Those who dream at night in the dusty recesses of their minds awaken to find it was in vanity. But dreamers of the day are dangerous men. For they may act their dreams with open eyes Come to on. make them a reality. We're talking about being dreamers of the day, wow. not just dreamers of the night, because we're acting our dreams with open eyes to make them a reality. So remember Jesus' words. Mark 10, 27, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. Yeah. All things are possible with God. Awesome. And the words of Paul, now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that's at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. To him who's able not just to do more than we ask. Like I think, I can ask for a lot. Then he talks about all we ask. I go, okay, that's all I can ask, you know. Then you go, how about imagine? All that I imagine. I can imagine a lot. How about all that I imagine? That's a lot. How about more than all I can ask or imagine? That's getting up there. How about immeasurably more? I can't reach it. You can't reach it. There's no quantifiable standard measurement that can reach the immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine that God can do according to his power and work within us yeah. for his glory in the church. That's what we got to believe in. So dream big. Spiritual, relational, individual, and congregational. Amen. According to His power Amen. that's at work within us. And help each other to find kingdom dreams like that. Yes. Greater vision. Undoubtedly, our God is a visionary God. Yes. He alone has the perfect vision of, of everything that has been, everything that is, and everything that ever will be. And as we're created in his image, we're his disciples. We're called to be visionaries to see like him and help open the eyes of others and fulfill his visions for us and his church. Proverbs 29, 18, without vision, the people perish. Where there's no revelation, people cast off restraint. 
We die, we rebel. If we're not seeing, pursuing, connecting with the vision that God has for us. We all need vision to be and to do our best for God. I really hope this series helps you gain a greater vision for your life. Greater vision begins with a vision of God. Then a vision of the past. A vision of the present. Then an eternal vision for the future. And then you make it really practical and live it out Come on. every day. And to God be the glory as we in the Des Moines Christian Church have that greater vision. Amen. God bless you. Let's pray for the community. Our Father, thank you for being a visionary and for having vision for us, believing in us, calling us to your number, empowering us, forgiving our sins, blessing us with such a wonderful body. We know we have our weaknesses, our sins. We also know we have your will and you want us to accomplish things. Father, I pray you open our eyes to, to see the possibilities. Mm -hmm. Open our eyes to see what your vision for our lives is. Help us to see our strengths, our gifts, our opportunities. And then give us the courage and the faith, the power to be able to live out those visions and bring you glory. We want to bring you glory in the church here in Des Moines and all throughout the entire state of Iowa and the whole world. Father, help us now as we commune with Jesus, as we take the bread that symbolizes his body, the juice that symbolizes his blood. Help us to see what he sees and join him in his vision. To you be the glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you didn't get a communion cup, please uh, raise your hand. I'm sure the ushers will help you find one.